Hello, and welcome to the National Book Festival. My name is Rob Casper from the Library of Congress, and I'm here with Kali Fajardo Anstein, whose feature book at the festival is Sabrina and Karina. If you'd like to see Kali's presentation at the festival, log in to nationalbookfestival.com. You'll find it on the fiction stage. Welcome, Kali, and so good to have you here virtually at the festival. Hi, thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to be here. Well, we're thrilled to have you answer questions by the uh, attendees here. Uh, folks, note that you can send in questions through the Q&A feature on the platform. Uh, I'll try my best to get to as many of the questions in the allotted time we have. Um, I just wanted to start by talking about place. Uh, I know you started writing this book in Denver, traveled a bit outside of uh, the city and the state to work on it and then came back. Can you tell us about that process? Yeah, so I, I actually started this book when I was very young. I was in my early 20s and I was going to Metropolitan State University of Denver, which is right down, right downtown, um, blocks away from where I live still to this day. And at that point, I didn't know I wanted to set out to write a collection about Denver that was set here, anything like that. I was just writing what was coming to me. And eventually I went to the University of Wyoming where I received my MFA in fiction. And the stories in Sabrina and Karina really started out, the majority were in my thesis. And after the University of Wyoming, I took a fellowship in South Carolina. I lived for a while in Key West, Florida. I lived in Durango, Colorado. And I was really moving and living in all these different parts of the country, trying to find jobs that would somehow fund my writing. And at the same time, I was working on the stories in Sabrina and Karina, and I was also working on my forthcoming novel. So the stories to me, they would bring me back to Denver when I was working on them when I was far away. And I was surprised when I got home, um, that was around 20, 2015, 2016, I was surprised when I came back to Colorado and I took a teaching job in Durango, um, how much the city had changed and how much my stories reflected a time and place that didn't necessarily exist anymore, um, but did in my book. Um, so yeah, it's been a really exciting process and I, I, wrote, I wrote these stories all over the country really. Can you talk about the place that existed before that is no longer there that's contained within the stories? Yeah, I think, one of the beautiful things about fiction is it sort of serves as an imaginative record of time. Um, and so this isn't a documentary, this isn't a nonfiction book, this is something that I invented, but it also was invented out of the reality that I knew growing up in Denver in the early 90s um, into the aughts. And during that time, Denver experienced rapid growth, rapid gentrification. And so there are areas in the city, neighborhoods like the West Side and the North Side and Five points, neighborhoods where my, my relatives and my ancestors lived that are no longer the same at all. And in fact, developers have tried to rename those places um, and in, in a way are completely erasing the history of what was once there. And so I think the stories in Sabrina and Karina really speak to a Denver of the mid 90s, the early 2000s. And some of the stories even go back further in time into the 1950s. And those stories are based on my ancestors' lives in this place. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, can you talk about the characters in the book, uh, uh, where they came from and uh, how they may connect to one another? Yeah, so the characters, I, I really, I'm an author that absolutely adores my characters. I think of them sort of like as friends. And even the characters who are quote unquote villains, essentially, I have to get to know them really well. And so I have to know their motives and what what it is about their soul that would make them commit these you know violent acts that sometimes happen. So some of the characters I would say are composites of real life people that I've known. Um, I'm thinking of the character Dodie in the story Sisters. She's based on a great, great auntie of mine. And while I had never met her in person, she died well before I was born. I had heard so many stories about her. And so when she um, revealed herself to me as a character, I remember I was walking around my 1890s apartment in Laramie, Wyoming. Um, it was really cold. It was the middle of winter. And this voice just started coming through me. And I pulled out my iPhone and I made a voice memo. And the cadence was nothing like the way I talk. And so 
sometimes my characters have the ability to overwhelm me. Um, but I, I find them, I think I find them sort of just out existing in the world. And when they reveal themselves to me, they're totally unique. And I feel, I feel in some way like they're real people that I've just, I've known somehow. Uh, Patricia asked about the research that you did for the book. And if there was anything that you found in the research that was surprising. I'd say some of the research that I did for the book, um, more so for my next book. And I think when uh, my novel is published, most of my talks will probably be about historical research. But the muscle I was building while I was researching Denver in the 1930s and 1920s was also contributing to the stories as I was revising them. For example, the story Sisters I mentioned is set in the 1950s. And one of the things that I found most surprising when I started digging through the state archives and um, genealogy centers is how little exists um, in terms of the Hispano Chicano uh, presence in Colorado, which is shocking because I believe a third of the state was once Mexico. And so our families are still here, but we're not existing in this this large historical way um, in the record, for, um, at least. So that was surprising to me. And then I started realizing that this is a larger problem. And so a lot of my work now has pushed me into sort of the zone of, I would say, archival justice. And I think a lot of it has to do with building relationships between communities of color who have been excluded from archives. And so you'll see more and more of my work, I think, take on that sort of tone as time goes on. Thank you for uh the question. Yes, yes. Well, and Glenna asked a, a question that's related to your response, which is uh, about uh, in difficulty you had published, getting published, and it, whether or not that was due to discrimination, both uh, uh, as a woman and as a Chicano, and how did that play out? I think, obviously, everything I've experienced in my life has come through that intersection of a woman, a Chicana. I'm also mixed race. Uh, my father is white. Um, and I, I also have characters who are mixed race. And so I think that was sort of new. <laughs> that, it's not new to me and it's not new to millions of people, but I think that that was sort of hard um, for maybe literary establishment to understand. Um, so the pathway to get published was very long. As I, I think I said earlier that Sabrina and Karina was my thesis and I graduated from 2013, or I graduated in 2013 from the University of Wyoming and I didn't receive a book deal until 2017. And so during that time, I was trying to get the stories published in literary journals, but I was never able to get out of a slush pile. Um, actually, I take that back. My very first publication, Remedies, in the Bellevue Literary Review, did get out of the slush pile. But for the most part, I was not able to get published through the traditional pathway. And so a lot of my publications had to come through human connection, meeting people, talking to them in person. And while that is, um, I'd say, a longer road to walk, when the book finally came out, I had a much larger community willing to welcome me. Um, so yeah, I don't have any regrets about the path. It just, it took a long time, but I think I'm where I'm supposed to be now. Yeah. Um, uh, Janina asked about uh, the, the kind of energy one needs to write seriously while holding down a full-time job. Um, and how do you maintain the momentum of the story when needing to put it aside? I think that's a, that's a really excellent question. And I think it's something we need to talk about more and more as writers, because this is not, um, if you're writing literary fiction, especially if you're writing literary short stories, you're not going to make a living right off the bat doing this. And so you have to be able to balance a day job with your writing. For me, it was difficult. I had to make sacrifices in my life. Um, my whole life is built toward my writing. And so I think that's another thing I had to do. So I took jobs that were less time consuming, less strenuous on me. When I got my book deal for Sabrina and Karina, I was a part-time office manager. And so I worked, um, I worked 20 hours a week in an old church for a legal, a legal nonprofit. And I would answer emails and I would file papers. And then I would go at like two o'clock and I'd go to a coffee shop or a library and I would write the rest of the afternoon. And then I'd wake up and I'd do it again. And so I had just been conditioned to live very frugally and not make very much money at my real job and then go and work on my stories and hope in the end it would pay off. Um, so my advice is to just 
try to have a plan about giving yourself over to your art and I think your art will repay you. Uh, there's a question just about uh, outlining and how do you how do you uh, set out uh, to sort of figure out each story? Do you do outlines? I do now. When I was a younger writer, I was much more driven by instinct and I would just get that sort of that flurry of I had like this great idea and I'd have to rush home from wherever I was and I'd have to write it all out. But as I got older, I realized that this was chaotic and it was not going to help me write on a schedule. So I create outlines, but I first allow my draft to start coming out naturally. And then I start to look at what the characters are doing. And so maybe about a quarter of the way through, that's when I make the first outline. And then I, I go through and I write the whole story and then I adjust the outline because the characters will normally sort of do what they want and go off in directions that you did not plan. Um, but yes, I do uh, maybe two or three rounds of outlining. Uh Ami's really excited to uh, encounter you in your work for the first time here uh, and wonders, as a brand new reader, uh, which story of yours you would recommend she start with? I would always recommend starting with the very first story in the book, which is why I put it as the first story, Sugar Babies. And I think Sugar Babies sort of gives readers an, a glimpse into the topics that I deal with, um, which are a lot have to do with feminism, um, the, this idea of place and connection to land, but it also showcases my humor and my lighter side, which I think a lot of the stories have, even if they can, they also have sort of this darker side to them as well. Uh, Patricia is actually very excited about uh, this new novel she's hearing about, and she wonders more about it. So can you tell her, uh, uh, tell her more about uh, what it's, what it's about? Yeah, I'd love to. So, I started a novel when I was much younger and I did not have the skill level that I had now or have now. And so I sort of abandoned it. But this is the big story that I always wanted to tell. And it's about my great grandmother's generation coming to Denver in the 1920s. And it follows their lives in the 1930s in Denver. Um, what I found unique about my family is that they did not come from very far away. They came from Northern New Mexico, Southern Colorado. And I always wanted to know what was our origin? You know, how did we become the people that we are living in the city where we live? Um, so it's a, it's a big multi-generational tale. It spans 1890 to 1933. It's got Wild West shows, tea leaf readings, snake charmers, and it's really fun to write. And I can't wait for you guys to read it. And can you talk about the process of writing that and how it might have been different than writing the short stories? And especially in terms of a sense of scope. That's a question from Patricia. Yeah. So I, it's just, to me, when I write a short story or when I start a novel, I don't really think of them as different. I think of myself as just writing. And the, the issue when I started the novel earlier was it's just a bigger story. And so I didn't have the momentum or stamina to keep working on a larger story. That was something that I had to develop over years of making myself write, meeting word quotas, and developing sort of this muscle memory as a writer. Um, also, the, the amount of historical research I had to do for this novel pales in comparison, or anything that I've ever done for the short stories pales in comparison to what I've had to do for the, a novel that is set in another era. Um, so I really had to learn a number of different skills while I was working on the book. And I had many what I would consider false starts, but they led to the, the right start. And the way that I wrote this was I would write chapters at a time and I would send them to my literary agent and she would give me notes and I would work on them, you know, one piece at a time. And so I really built this book over a span of years. Mm -hmm. uh, what's the first story uh, in Sabrina and Karina that you finished? And what was the hardest story uh, that you had to write? I'm curious. Yeah, I, the very first story that I wrote was, it actually was ghost sickness. I wrote ghost sickness when I was an undergrad at uh, Metro State, but the very first story that I wrote and got published was Remedies, and I revised it heavily um, for the book. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, yeah, but the, the, the chronology of the stories, it kind of, the younger characters, I mostly wrote those when I was a younger person. Hmm. And uh, tell us about the challenge of the connection between uh, your 
at wanting to tell the tale of your family and creating this novel the between you know the fact of of your family and your family's migration and and the, what what became this piece of fiction i think it's it's never been conflicting for me i don't my family is very proud and honored that i'm writing about us we've never been in any books so i think like they're just so excited um and I think some people are, you know, they're shocked that my family would be so celebratory when I deal with very heavy themes. But these are themes that have been dealing, my family has been dealing with and my community has been dealing with for generations. And so I think they're, they're more excited to see someone finally talking about it in this way. Um, in terms of wanting to tell the story and stay true to the story and also tell, you know, write a novel, I, I am not, I'm not writing nonfiction about my family. I am inventing, I'm using plot, I'm using all the skills of fiction. And so in that way, it's actually been really freeing and it's been a really interesting way to get to know my ancestors because I'm sort of letting my subconscious mind allow me to see what these characters would do and how they would behave. And it's it's sort of like knowing your great grandparents in a way that you would never know because they're, you're not gonna be there with them on their first date or the first time they have sex with somebody or you know these really strange moments that your great grandparents would never tell you about. But now as a writer, I'm going through and I'm sort of looking at these moments really closely and it's it's fascinating. Mm -hmm. uh, my colleague Michelle asked a very smart question, and of course, you know we are the Library of Congress. She asks, "Where do you do your research? The libraries, archives?" Yes, I I use libraries extensively. Uh, a little known secret about me is that I applied to library science programs twice, and both times I was accepted, but each time I sort of drifted away and moved back toward my writing. Um, but I did an internship in records management in Washington, D.C., and I was all set to become an archivist. So I am always working with libraries. I love librarians. I wanted to be one of you. <laughs> and I ended up going a different path. But I work a lot at the Denver Public Library's Western Genealogy Floor. It's um, one of the most exquisite collections that we have here in the American West. Wow. Uh Tiffany asks a question about um, how to get uh, your book and stories uh, of people who are too often overlooked into school curriculums. I would, I would say um, something that I did when my book first came out, I wrote handwritten postcards to the chairs of Chicano Studies all across the Southwest. And I wrote bookstores, um, handwritten postcards. I wrote emails to teachers in the area. And so at the beginning, nobody knew who I was. Nobody knew about these characters. Nobody knew anything. And after a while, people started reading the book and then they would share the information that they had learned with other people. Um, but I think you just have to start somewhere and just start letting people know that your work exists in the world and get it up there to the decision makers in the curriculum. Uh, Natalie says there are so many good Chicano, Chicano short story writers. Who are your favorites? I I would love to know who Nat. I would love to know Natalie's list too because there's we don't have very many um, Mexican American identifying short story writers. I can think of Sandra Cisneros and Elena Maria Villaramontes. And I believe Kirsten Valdez Quaid identifies as Chicana. Um, but I really would love to see more and more coming to the table. And I think that's on publishers to start giving our books a chance and publishing more. Mm. Um, tell us about uh, your relationship with your publisher and, and what they've done to really support this book and, and get behind uh, the forthcoming novel as well. Definitely. So. My publisher is Penguin Random House, and I'm on the imprint One World, and I've just had a spectacular experience. I've always felt nurtured and supported. They allowed me to pick my cover art, um, or they allowed me to pick the artist for my cover, which is unheard of. Um, they listen to me when I, when I say, hey, I don't know if this edit is going in the right direction. And so I feel like I have a lot of freedom, but I also have professionals who are saying like, we know best, so allow us sometimes to, <laughs> to like give you some of our knowledge. Um, One World bought both Sabrina and Karina and my forthcoming novel at the same time in 2017. And at the time when my editor, Nicole Counts, 
when she made the offer, I didn't expect anyone would want to publish Sabrina and Karina because I had been told time and time again that the big five publishers do not want to take chances on short story collections. And so in that way, I think One World is also unique because they're taking chances, they're publishing groundbreaking work, they're publishing poetry, they're publishing short story collections. Um, and it's just, it's such a remarkable imprint and I'm, I'm super proud to be on One World. Well, and they must have felt just so affirmed. And you too, uh, <laughs> when uh, you got the National Book Festival nod, uh, nomination. So uh, congratulations to, to both you and your editor for, for, for uh, bucking that, that bad advice. Um, Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> Kristen asks about the pandemic and if it's impacting your writing life or your writing. Yeah, it's it's impacted my writing life extensively. Um, my my main source of income is no longer there. Um, so the way that I was making any sort of income was doing live speaking events. And since that's gone, it's it's really shifted. Um, my finances in a significant way. And so that's created stress that then that goes over to the writing situation. Um, but one of the other ways that it's, it's impacted my writing is that I never expected that I would write stories that are set during this time, but I already wrote a couple. <laughs> so I'm already writing about it. And I, I do think that it's, um, it's just so challenging for so many artists right now because the ways that we make money are few and far between. Hmm. And what's it like to write stories about the here and now uh, after having worked uh, for so long on a book set in the past and connected to your ancestors? You know, I, I, I think that as human beings, there's some, you know, element about us that does not really change. And when I'm working on characters in the 1890s and when I'm working with characters right now, that core, that thing that makes us human, that is unchanging. And so I don't find it that uh, difficult to switch between time periods. It's more like learning about the nuance of that particular time. And one of the things that's defining this time period right now um, is the way we're interacting with each other with half our face covered. <laughs> so I think that that is something that's already happened, though, in American history um, during the, the great influenza pandemic. So there are novels and there are short stories that also deal with that. Mm. Uh, we have a question, uh, but first it's a thanks for your great work. Uh, but the follow-up question then is, has Latin American literature been an influence on you at all? Yeah, definitely. Um, being from Colorado and being of a family that's mixed race and indigenous to the Southwest, I, I wasn't really sure when I was growing up which literature that I would find home in. Um, and so when I was a teenager, I really started reading a lot of works in translation. Um, Albert Camus, The Stranger, Kafka's work. But another writer who became very influential to me very young was Gabriel Garcia Marquez. And so 100 Years of Solitude, I would say, is probably the most influential book um, to me, probably next to like Harry Potter. <laughs> I love the Harry Potter books. <laughs> yeah, well, and I will say uh, there was a, a similar sort of question that uh, uh, an audience member posed to Colson Whitehead, and he said the same thing. So you you two share uh, uh, Marquez as a very profound influence. That, that's interesting. <laughs> yeah. Um, Roxanne asks about the need to tell the stories you tell. Where, uh, t talk about the, the kind of driving impulse behind those the stories. You know, I, I think there's a quote from Hemingway that's, that's something like every writer needs a built in shockproof shit detector. And I think I, um, I always grew up with sort of this idea that I understood pretty, pretty like, you know, immediately what injustice was when I saw it. I felt it when I was a little girl. I felt it between conversations with people. And I always was sort of interested in like revealing why that injustice was happening. And so I don't know where this drive comes from. I think it has something to do with my family. My mother is an activist um, and she's she's done Chicana programming in the schools all across Colorado for 30 years. Um, so I do think it's inherited in some way. But I, I just think it's part of my outlook on life and my worldview. And when I get the urge to write a story, it usually comes sort of spontaneously. It's sort of like it's bubbling out of me and I just can't keep it in anymore. Uh, Kathy uh, says that you mentioned uh, the challenges of writing about difficult topics. And are there topics or subjects that are difficult that you hope to address in the future in your writing? 
you know, I, I, I don't really, I don't write based on topics. So I don't have like a list of topics that I want to address. Um, I think whatever comes out in my, my work comes through the characters. And so in the next book, there's some topics that I'm sort of taking on that I didn't take on in Sabrina and Karina. And one of them is masculinity and women's relationships to different uh, male family members and to men in their community. And so I think that is something that I didn't, I didn't choose to start exploring, but I definitely did not explore it as much in Sabrina and Karina. Yeah, can you talk about the moment when, as a writer, you suddenly confront a subject or a plot or a sort of a character decision that you didn't expect that seems difficult and how you sort of push into it or push through it? That's a that's an excellent question. Um, I can think of several places in Sabrina and Karina where that happened. Um, so I was really, really surprised in the short story, Any Further West, when the the narrator told me essentially that her mother dies young and she ODs. And while I did not put that scene in the short story, I did write it. And it was very difficult for me to take on. I remember crying and thinking like, I don't want to kill my characters. And so there, I do have this sort of connection to them, but sometimes they do reveal things that are very painful for even me as the author to write about. But I think it's it's serving a purpose for the characters, but it also is helping readers who maybe have experienced similar things or you know have gone through something that's adjacent to that experience. So when I when characters sort of present something that's difficult like that or shocking, I usually my impulse is to listen to them and try to understand why they're revealing this. Hmm. So Janina's asking, uh, at what point in life did you decide you wanted to be a writer? I am one of those weirdos that <laughs> I only wanted to do one thing my whole life. I Well, that's not true. So I wanted to be an astronomer when I was a little girl or a country singer, but I can't sing. And I still am obsessed with space, but I definitely did not want to become an astronomer after a while. But I was writing stories since the time I was in first or second grade. I think I did my first writer's workshop in third grade. Um, but yeah, it's I'm one of those people that always wanted to do this. But that's not to say that people who don't have that like one directional arrow are not writers because there's all kinds of different levels of when did you start? And some people don't pick up the pen until they're in middle or late age and they become wonderful writers. When did you decide you wanted to uh, be a writer as a profession? I, al I, always, I always did it. I always yeah. Did it. <laughs> yeah. It was the dream. I didn't expect that I would get my dream and that's why I wanted to be other things along the path. Mm -hmm. Well, luckily you did, and we're thrilled to have you here at the National Book Festival in celebration of your book. Uh, thank you so much for your time, Kali. Uh, uh, we've been speaking with Kali Fajardo Anstein, whose book is Sabrina and Corina. You can find her presentation on the fiction stage of the National Book Festival at nationalbookfestival.com.